current session. And first up, we have Aaron Voigt from NC State University speaking on nursery habitat used by juvenile blue crabs. Thank you, Erica. All right, so as most of you know, uh, nursery habitats are incredibly essential because they promote the survival of juveniles into the adult population. And because of this, they are often um, important targets for both restoration and management practices. However, I don't think I need to tell you guys, often the funding and resources for these um, restoration and management uh, groups are limited. And so therefore we need to come up with a standardized framework used to properly identify what is and isn't a nursery habitat, as well as value them when there are multiple habitats used. Uh, two particular frameworks that I'll be referencing in my study today are the nursery role hypothesis, which was coined by Beck et al. in 2001, and it defines the nursery habitat as the habitat which provides the greatest number of individuals on a per unit area basis to the spawning stock. And so in this very simplistic um, example I have right here, Habitat A would be the nursery habitat using the nurse, nursery role hypothesis. And it should be stated that here we are assuming that both habitats have an equal contribution to the adult population. However, there's another framework um, that came from Dahlgren et al. in 2006, and that's the effective juvenile habitat. Here, this defines um, the nursery habitat as the habitat which provides the largest proportion in total to the spawning stock. Um, and so here, while you can see that the crab numbers within the you know, meter quadrat in red are the same, habitat B would actually be the nursery habitat in this example because the total amount of juvenile crabs is greater. It should also be noted that in the effective juvenile habitat, the dispersal forces play a major role. So again, we can see that the amount of crabs in the red quadrat are equal or are the same as in the first example. And while the habitat area is also the same, the total number of juveniles is greater in habitat B because they're more equally distributed across the habitat. So this gets into the overarching objective of my research, which is to understand how habitat characteristics and species distribution patterns affect nursery habitat distinction within these frameworks. Uh, to do this, we're gonna use the uh, North Carolina blue crab as our model species. It's a great model species for looking at something like this because it's both valuable, um, both economically and ecologically, as uh, if you guys got to sit in on the blue crab and seagrass talks earlier today, they did a great job outlining this. Um, the fishery is also in decline in North Carolina. It's currently considered overfished. And juvenile blue crabs use multiple nursery habitats within coastal North Carolina, and they also have complex distribution patterns. That makes them really interesting at comparing these uh, differing habitat frameworks. So a quick introduction, um, if you did go to those earlier talks, they were focusing more on uh, Southern North Carolina. I'm focusing the study on the Northern part of our coast, particularly the Albemarle, Pamlico, Estuarine system. I'll generally refer to that as apes throughout this um, presentation. Quick refresher, this is going to be a large lagoonal estuary. It's very shallow. Um, it's dominated by high riverine input and very limited oceanic input, primarily through the inlet shown here, Oregon, Hatteras, and Ocracoke. And because of this, it is a primarily wind-driven system. So the tidal impacts are very small and are generally concentrated just around those small inlets. In particular, juvenile blue crabs use three particular habitats within apes. The first is going to be these eastern seagrass beds, and they're located on the back side of the outer banks. They're um, sometimes referred to as mixed seagrass beds because they um, take part, uh, they are partially filled up with Zostra, Halidulli, and Rupia. So you generally have a mixed species assemblage here. On the western side of apes, however, you have these highly ephemeral, very patchy, low salinity seagrass beds, um, which I refer to as either western seagrass or as rupia beds because they are 100% dominated by rupia maritima. 
Furthermore, on the Western shore, we have something called shallow detrital habitat or SDH as I will be referring to this. SDH um, is the habitat that occurs on an erosional marsh edge where it's primarily made up of the peat mass from the marsh along with roots and shoots from the um, degraded marsh. And you can see a photo of it up here as to what it kind of looks like in hand. Uh, we believe while uh, mapping is currently underway that SDH is the primary habitat on the Western shore, whereas Eastern seagrass is the primary habitat on the Eastern shore. So quick refresher, blue crabs have what is considered a complex life cycle. And in particular, this is important to this study because they spend their larval stages um, off the coast um, near the continental shelf before recruiting back in through these tiny um, inlet openings and then settling in the habitat within. This recruitment period um, generally happens between August and October, and that's where we will be basing our study of this system. In particular, this study looks at the instar stage. So this is the stage immediately following the megalopa. Um, and we are looking at uh, blue crabs smaller than 20 millimeters. So these are very, very new settled uh, blue crabs. So there are two primary distribution mechanisms that blue crabs use to settle in the eastern and western habitats. Under normal settlement conditions, the blue crabs will recruit through the inlets and then immediately settle into the seagrass beds on the backside of um, the outer banks. Uh, as they continue to settle there, the density will increase and you will get density dependent secondary dispersal where the blue crabs will behaviorally hop back up into the water column and will ride um, wind influence currents across the sound settling in the Western habitats. The second method for um, blue crabs to hit those Western habitats is going to be through storm-driven dispersal. So this is whenever you have a tropical storm or a hurricane come through that'll push the megalopa past those Eastern habitats and will result in them settling directly into the Western habitats. And so as you can imagine with this differentiation of habitats between the east and the west, as well as these different dispersal mechanisms, this really provides an interesting area to study how these three habitats interact in, um, in terms of which are used the most by juvenile blue crabs. So to break this down a little bit more, I have three primary objectives. The first is to quantify the spatial variation in mean blue crab densities across the Eastern and Western region, as well as within those three different habitats that I discussed before. The second is to identify the regional or the cross sound distribution pattern. So what's causing the blue crabs to be distributed between the Eastern and Western shores. And then the third objective is to identify local distribution factors. So these are the distribution factors within a habitat and particularly looking at distance from the nearest inlet or um, source of megalope and seagrass structural complexity. So to do this, we kick netted at 11 sites across apes, which are shown here um, as different colored symbols. Uh, there were six on the East Coast. These were all primarily seagrass or they were all seagrass period. And that can be shown by these triangular symbols here. Um, we also had five sites on the Western coast of apes. Um, and these were a mix of both SDH, which is shown as circular symbols, and that ephemeral rupia beds, which are shown as triangles here, um, and in these three sites up here. Uh, in addition to kick netting for blue crabs, we also took seagrass cores at all of the seagrass locations. Um, and then we went back to the lab and enumerated the crabs as well as took precise measurements for size in order to get a size distribution. So to answer objective one, which is quantifying the mean density across all three habitats, what we found was actually quite surprising. Um, and that was that the Western, so these highly ephemeral seagrass beds on the Western shore had four times the amount of juvenile blue crabs than both the inlet adjacent mixed species beds and the um, shallow detrital habitat. And in particular, what also was interesting is that these uh, 
seagrass beds that are, again, quite close to where the sources of megalopa would be coming in or are statistically equal to the Western marsh adjacent habitat. So this is really interesting and obviously raised a number of questions because it was not what we were expecting. Um, and it led us to really look into what are some of the um, forces causing distribution in these areas. So the first thing that we looked at was what is causing the cross sound distribution. So how are crabs getting to the Western shore? Um, and to remind you, there are two ways that this generally happens, either density dependent secondary dispersal where crabs originally settle in the Eastern seagrass bed, build up a density and then migrate across or storm driven dispersal where they settle initially in the Western seagrass beds. And the way that we can tell the difference between these two strategies is looking at the size distribution. So this data right here is from Etherington and Eggleston in 2000. And what it shows is on the left are our early recruits. So these are the very young J1 through J2 juvenile blue crabs. And on the right are the later recruits, the J3 through J5. Um, in black, you see the eastern, so these are your inlet adjacent habitats, and in white, you see the western habitats. Then you have month and year along the x-axis. But what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we saw with her data, there was a much higher abundance of early recruits in the eastern beds and a higher abundance of later recruits in the western beds. And so what this is indicative of is this is going to be your density dependent secondary dispersal. So the young initially um, settle in Eastern beds and then migrate across resulting in a higher proportion in the Western beds. However, for the 2019 data, again, we're looking at the early recruits on the left, later recruits on the right, East is in black, West is in white, right? We found that there was no significant difference between um, the sizes here. And so what this is indicative of is storm-driven dispersal. And this makes sense based upon our timeline because Hurricane Dorian hit approximately three weeks before sampling. And so this may have resulted in pushing a large proportion of early megalopa past those Eastern habitats and settling directly into the Western habitats. So that's kind of the first piece of this puzzle of why we might be seeing this really high recruitment on these Western ephemeral seagrass beds is because we have some direct settlement occurring. Um, so that leads us to our third major objective is what's going on within each of these habitats. Um, in particular, how does distance from the nearest inlet, in this case uh, sources of megalopa, and seagrass structural complexity affect uh, the blue crab density. And I'm gonna say right now, we ran both of these things across all the habitats to break it down and make it a little bit easier. I'm just presenting the ones that are statistically significant. So here is a map showing the density of blue crabs um, spatially. Um, so the size of the circle relates to how many crabs were found there. The color of the circle relates to the habitat. So your bright green is your mixed bed Eastern uh, seagrass habitats, your dark green is your rupia, uh, western bed seagrass, and then the tan or beige is your SDH habitat. Um, and what we found was that for each of these three habitats, the local uh, dispersal mechanisms were significant or were habitat specific. So in, oopsies, in our eastern um, mixed bed seagrass beds, what you can see uh, in this map right here is that you have really high densities of seagrass occurring directly next to the inlet. So the inlets are circled in red. However, as you move away, so into Rodanthe and then kind of into the elbow of Hatteras and Frisco, you see much um, decreased blue crab densities. And in fact, when we uh, chart these up, so distance from the nearest inlet with crab densities, we find that there is a very clear negative relationship that the blue crab densities decrease strongly as we move farther away from the inlets. It should be noted that we also did this in SDH and our Western beds, and there was no significant difference or trend um, in those habitats. All right, so moving on to the Western seagrass habitats. Again, these are our rupia habitats. 
What we found was that the density here was driven primarily by seagrass shoot density. So as the shoot density of seagrass increased, we found a very sharp increase in crab density. And again, we definitely tested this in the mixed uh, Eastern seagrass beds and found no significant difference there. Lastly, we looked at SDH and SDH was rather interesting because it was the most equally distributed. So there was no significant difference between the sites shown here. However, there does appear to be a slight trend of a higher density occurring right at Stumpy Point. And this is supported by prior um, research done by my lab, particularly Rains et al. 2006 and 2007, which found that there was a primary recruitment corridor going from Oregon Inlet right here across into Stumpy Point. So what are our major conclusions from this study? The first is that these Western ephemeral rupia beds are very important to juvenile blue crabs. Uh, in fact, we found a four time density increase in these habitats compared to your inlet adjacent beds. Secondly, we found that at least in the 2019 study, um, that cross sound transportation was driven primarily by storm driven. And this resulted in a higher abundance of younger juveniles settling in these Western habitats. Um, the third was that we found that blue crabs had a lot of um, habitat specific local dispersal. So this meant that in Eastern seagrass beds, they were primarily hydrologically driven. So this is most likely due to the um, tidal forcings right around the inlets that drove them to settle in higher quantities there, but not necessarily to reach um, the seagrass that was farther away. However, in Western seagrass beds, um, it was driven mostly by habitat complexity. And lastly, SDH um, was fairly evenly distributed, but there did appear to be some evidence for this um, recruitment corridor going from Oregon Inlet to Stumpy Point. So what does this mean in terms of those nursery frameworks that I originally presented to you guys in the introduction? So it actually forms a really interesting dichotomy where assuming that the survival to the adult population is equal in all three of the habitats, what we find is if we use the nursery role hypothesis as the framework, our key nursery would be the Western seagrass bed because the density there is so high. However, if you, because the footprint of those Western seagrass beds is so small, if you were to use the effective juvenile habitat framework, it would possibly point to either the Eastern seagrass or SDH is the primary nursery habitat. So this really points to the idea that when, um, as restoration or conservation managers, we really need to think about which framework we wanna use, and in particular, what objectives we want to um, act out when we define what is and isn't our most valued nursery habitat. So with that, I would love to thank the Eggleston Lab um, who helped me do all this work as well as all of my funding sources and ask for any questions. So we do have two minutes for questions. And if you will, please speak into a mic. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, what would happen on a non-storm year? So we are analyzing the 2017 and 18 data right now, which are gonna give us uh, 2018, I think was a non-storm year. Florence? Um, no, okay, 2017. <laughs> One of them was a non-storm year. Um, and what we know from that is that we still do see really high quantities of crabs in those um, rupia beds. Um, I'm currently analyzing to see if they're at that like four times um, proportional level, but we, I mean, I found, I think at one point, like over a hundred crabs per meter squared in those um, Western seagrass beds in 2017. Um, so we're still seeing really high densities. What I can say is you don't see, you do see the age distribution um, in 2017. We do have much 
older crabs on that western shore. So my going theory of how the SDH and the rupia beds work is regardless of the distribution, so whether it's storm driven or um, density dependent secondary, they basically fan out across the western shore. If they are lucky enough to come across the extremely ephemeral um, rupia beds, they're stoked and a bunch of them settle there. If they are not so likely to come into contact with one of them, they settle into SDH, but just based upon how um, the wind-driven currents kind of push in that, what is it, uh, counterclockwise uh, cycle out of Oregon Inlet, I think a lot of them do get picked up from the uh, inlet adjacent seagrass and get pushed over to the western shore when they just kind of uh, flip a coin to figure out where they're going to end up. All right. Um, next is Alexander Smith from UNCW, who is studying lease turns and their response to human related activities. Uh, hello, all. Thanks for coming to my presentation. Um, yeah, so my project is on lease turn disturbance responses to human related activities in Hatteras Island, North Carolina. Uh, so we've heard a lot about stuff going on kind of under the water in this case. I'm going to focus a little more on the air right now. Um, okay. um, so for anyone that doesn't know, um, lease terns are a, uh, a water bird that nests on the beaches. Um, so you can actually see here in these two photos, I have um, a nest with a single egg in it. And then one with, it's kind of hard to tell in the photo, which I'll get into a little bit why that is so, but two chicks actually there. Um, and so these birds uh, complete most of their breeding activity on these very open, unobstructed beach areas, usually very little vegetation, which allows them uh, the ability to see very far across this landscape, which they do for the purposes of being able typically to see their predators approaching from a lot of angles and from a great distance, um, which can typically be a really good thing for them so they can respond to them. And being a colonial water bird, um, it allows them to kind of mob a lot of these potential predators. However, as you can imagine, this also means that they can see a lot of humans who also recreate on these beaches moving around. And as I'm sure you can also imagine, uh, humans are seen as predators in a lot of cases to these birds, which might promote certain disturbance responses if they do see us as a possible predator. Um, I'll also point out here that uh, these eggs and chicks, as you can tell, are pretty cryptically colored. Um, so it's kind of hard to see them on the beaches. Um, if you don't know what you're looking for, I've been doing this for years and I still have a hard time finding them now and then. Um, but once again, this is good for pre preventing depredation. But obviously if we allow people to just walk unmitigated or drive unmitigated, because these are driving beaches as well around this area, it's very easy to completely accidentally step on eggs or chicks for this species. Um, and so to try to limit that, uh, specifically Cape Hatteras and P Island National Wildlife Refuge, which are two of my study site areas, use what are called conservation buffers. So um, pictured here, literally just signs with string and flag between them to create a sort of fence, if you will, to keep people out of these areas to try to keep any like accidental uh, mortalities from happening in regards to these birds during their breeding season. Um, and so Cape Hatteras is funding this project um, because they um, are trying to test their current buffer sizes to see if those are adequate or if they need to change those to make them better to more adequately protect the species. Um, and so Cape Hatteras itself, their main goal as stated here is to provide for beach recreation, but also of course that necessitates an adequate protection of the natural resources as this at the end of the day is a national park. Um, and these buffers, this the use of these buffers was initiated by a lawsuit um, which helped them develop this uh, off-road vehicle management plan um, and so all of that requires that all this data has to be based off peer reviewed science, which is where myself and also my co researchers enter into this. Um, and then the wildlife buffers also have to be of the shortest distance and duration throughout the breeding season. Um, and so currently these buffers are 100 meters for eggs and chicks, based off, as you see, a study from 1989 completed by Irwin, which looked at a very short uh, window over their breeding season and also at many different spots throughout. Uh, North Carolina and Virginia that didn't just focus on Cape Hatteras. So my study area, as I kind of already mentioned, is at Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge. And you can see some of our colony locations uh, for a few years in the circle, the blue circle there. And then also obviously uh, Cape Hatteras National Seashore, 
and which you can see some colony locations that we've used um, over these past two seasons as well. So I have three main null hypotheses that I'm testing for this project, or at least that I'll talk about today. Um, one is that these uh, buffer designs that 100 meters do currently adequately protect the birds. Um, also looking at different types of disturbance. So like I mentioned, they have pedestrians, vehicles, even different types of vehicles, um, non-human related sources of disturbance, if these differentially affect the birds. And then perhaps one of the more important questions is do they habituate to people, right? Can we get to a point where the birds see people enough that we can actually shorten these buffers even more? So breaking this down into the two different field seasons, I had two different types of study designs here. The first season in 2021 is more opportunistic. I'll get more into 2022 in a little bit. So in 2021, I took this kind of three-pronged approach. Three -pronged approach. Um, we counted the number of human-related. So this includes things like pedestrians, uh, dogs on or off leash that are obviously like domestic dogs, I'm not talking uh, coyotes here, um, and uh, vehicles. And then non-human-related is pretty much anything else. Um, and then specifically counting anything within 150 meters of the closest edge nest, which once again is based on this paper that the current buffers are based on, uh, Irwin 1989. Um, we also watched nests for up to 10 minutes and recorded any and all opportunistic responses to disturbances to try to get um, a good comparison between natural or non-human related and human related sources of disturbance. And so the, our three main uh, response variables are pictured here. So to kind of explain these real quick, agitation and flight initiation distance is the distance at which a source of disturbance, say a person, was to the nest when the bird either showed agitation behavior or took flight off the nest, or chicks for this matter. Um, and then flight duration is fairly self-explanatory. How long was the bird then in the air before coming back down the substrate after the source either left or was there for a while? And then we also followed uh, the NPS during their usual uh, daily monitoring activities. Since they're already potentially disturbing the birds, doing, I will say not greatly, but potentially disturbing the birds as they drive by, we were able to use this GPS track log to establish very um, verifiable distances at which the birds may respond to their typically trucks or UTVs. So um, first looking at these potential sources of disturbance, um, I wanna first pull your eye to the fact that I do have a pretty severe axis break here. And that is due to the fact that um, those two rightmost colonies, pole 47 and 57 were pretty much roadside. Um, so those numbers, this is throughout the entire season, those numbers are the amount of traffic that went up and down Highway 12 within about a three hour period each day throughout the entire summer that we were out there. So um, that's why I have that break there because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see any of the other data um, below there. But you can see beyond that, the main breakdown comes into uh, natural sources of disturbance, um, pedestrians and ORVs are kind of the three main ones there. Then if we look at differences between human-related and non-human-related sources of disturbance, um, looking at, once again, these three main response variables, FID, AID, and flush duration, um, we can see that there is, in fact, a significant difference between the human-related on the left, the pink or orangish color, and the non-human-related, which is that blue color on the right, which goes to show that um, we do, in fact, need to do something to um, protect against these human-related disturbances as they do seem to have a significantly higher response effect for these birds. Then looking at habituation just in 2021, um, I've included a line here so you can picture where that 100 meter buffer currently sits. Um, you can see that most of the non-human-related disturbance responses are below that line um, and that there's a general up curve throughout the season until about halfway in which it seems the birds tend to um, have this like slow denouement uh, towards the end of the season as they uh, respond at lower levels. However, when we look at human-related disturbance, uh, you can see it's generally flat towards the beginning of the season. Once again, in this case, a little bit higher. It's closer the whole time to that 100-meter buffer that we are currently using, but has an upstroke towards the end of the season, which provides some pot potential evidence of uh, no or not as much habituation to uh, people, potentially, throughout a season. Then in 2022, um, we focused it uh, more on uh, manipulated treatments. So instead of these opportunistic um, observations, we actually approached uh, with our own researchers um, as pedestrians and off-road vehicles and also passed by colonies and nests. 
And so this was to try to figure out even more, uh, you get a little more power out of our system, our study designed to establish um, better measurements for these distances. Um, we also, once again, use those incidental disturbances um, using the NPS. And even in this case, our own research uh, interactions with the birds as we completed walkthroughs to take nest counts um, to try to bolster the data set without creating any more disturbance than was necessary. Using that track log, once again, uh, we were able to get down to an accuracy of about three meters, uh, give or take. Um, but this time we only focused in Cape Hatteras, not in P Island. So uh, just three colonies in Cape Hatteras. So um, this is probably the biggest takeaway I would like everyone to kind of take away from this talk. Um, so combining both the uh, flight initiation distance, so the distance at which the birds responded with flight, and combining some data, which you can see as censored points, which are these kind of uh, crosses or hashes along the line, um, our data at which we approached the nest very closely, but there was no response from those birds. So combining these together, we're able to build these response distance probability curves. Um, and so you can see here generally for all three of these even, um, not much of a response from between 300 and 200 meters. Um, but once you approach that kind of 100 meter buffer that as it currently exists, perhaps even to the 75 meter area, we see a fairly sharp uptick in the responses of these birds. And then uh, except for the pedestrian approaches, a bit of a plateau um, once you get to around the 50 meter mark. Um, then looking at disturbance response by type, right? Because that was one of those hypotheses that I wanted to test. Um, just looking at these two. So to give a little explanation for resettle distance, the distance at which um, the birds came back down to, in this case, substrate um, after a source of disturbance has left the area, right? So these kind of opposite ends of the same response here. Um, and so in this case, you can see that um, trucks are significantly higher than the other ones here. Um, and generally we did have a significant difference across all four of these types. Um, but when you actually pull it out, it's really just like trucks that seem to be that one that um, are uh, significantly different from the rest. Um, I will point out that Jeep, we kind of did a few at the end to make sure it wasn't just our truck that we were using consistently throughout the whole time that was creating these different differences. Um, and Jeep was in fact a little bit lower. So I would say if anything, it doesn't show a lot of evidence that the birds are habituating to like that specific white Ford truck. Um, but honestly, more data is needed to completely say that with much confidence. Um, and then, but then looking at this AID and the flush duration, um, there wasn't really a significant difference between these different um, sources of disturbance. Um, however, you can, you can see just by looking at it that uh, the pedestrians seem to have a little more variance in the flight uh, flush duration um, versus the other types of disturbance. Then uh, moving on to habituation for 2022, uh, we got some really interesting data looking at the uh, flight initiation distance across the season. So uh, you can see this sinusoidal curve there. And the main thing I wanna point out there that is super interesting is that that first inflection point when it starts moving up was around when our first chicks hatched. And then the main point where it starts to um, descend is around when the first chicks fledged. And this uh, agrees with a lot of literature out there that shows that most of the time um, these breeding birds show a much higher aggression um, when the chicks first hatch. And then as you can imagine, once the chicks can kind of take care of themselves and fledge so they can fly away and kind of move away from predators on their own, um, the parents start, start to show less of a response investment um, towards the end of the season. However, um, you can see looking at once again, the closest we were able to approach with no response, we did seem to be able to get closer throughout the season, showing that there could be some potential evidence of habituation in these birds. Um, in this case, this is once again, just for human related disturbances. Um, so that is a potential that we may just be able to get closer even if they're still responding at a greater distance. Um, and I just wanna compare this again to the 2021 data, which obviously shows a little bit uh, of a different pattern there, right? That had more of the upstroke for human related disturbance. Um, but you can see kind of almost a similar thing, right? It starts rising again around where about the first chicks hatch, except in this case, it keeps going up through the chicks fledging. Um, and then looking at habituation within a treatment itself, right? So we completed several passes and several approaches within a single treatment for pedestrian and off-road vehicles. Um, this one is a little bit harder to pull apart anything, except that you can see the actual second approach. Or, uh, yeah, second approach by pedestrians seems to 
have it, um, begun at a slightly further distance than the rest. But then once you get within that about 150 meter area, they seem to kind of uh, all jumble together. However, looking at pedestrian passes, oddly enough, you can see that uh, four is our first pass. So it's the fourth part of our treatment, but the first pass of each of these um, is, is um, higher than the rest. So the birds are responding at greater distances for the first pass, but then they all kind of um, jumble together for the last three there. Um, so this also kind of goes along with a lot of the literature out there that shows that birds can commit this dread response, where they kind of freak out in the beginning, but then uh, settle down a little bit more after that. And then off-road vehicle passes, um, you can see it's, it doesn't have necessarily a clear pattern there. So some general conclusions, um, the number of potential sources of disturbance does vary by colony quite a bit, but is not necessarily a good predictor of responses. Um, least turn disturbance responses to human-related activity does have a sharp uptick around that 75 to 100 meters. And the specific disturbance itself, right? So pedestrian versus truck versus cheap versus Jeep um, has a fairly great influence on how the birds respond. Um, and just to bring that back to, uh, I realized I forgot to mention this. Um, if you saw the birds responded to trucks less of the time, if you looked at the sample size, but when they did respond to those trucks, it seemed to be to a greater degree, which is an interesting point there. And there uh, is some evidence of potential habituation, um, specifically looking at that 2022 data. However, this can be hard. Um, it could be potentially confounded by these interspecific factors, such as the time of the season. Um, based on whether there are nests or chicks present, or fledglings for that matter. Um, and so uh, generally, I would like to thank uh, Cape Hatteras National Seashore with the Park Service for uh, funding my project. Um, also, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, specifically in Pea Island, for working with us uh, throughout uh, both of my research seasons and being excellent collaborators and always willing to help us out when possible. And then the UNCW Danner Lab, um, you can see my advisor and co-researcher uh, pictured there, as well as Ali Best and Jose Francisco, who are our technicians for both summers. Uh, we could not have done this without them. We, uh, there were a lot of nests to gather and collect data on both summers, and I am in incredibly grateful to all of them for being such a great team. So, So based on everything you learned, what is your recommendation to the Park Service? So we're still kind of, this is this data is still fairly preliminary. Um, so I quite frankly don't feel completely comfortable making a recommendation at this point. Um, considering I'm on Zoom and I don't know who's watching, um, I would rather not make that statement. Um, but the biggest thing I would say is that looking at the data as we currently see it, it does seem like at least the sharp uptick in the response around that 100 meter area seems to relate to me that there could be good evidence that that current 100 meter buffer um, as it currently stands is potentially a pretty good uh, starting point at least for these buffers. Mm -hmm. um, so you said they were colonial species and I was wondering if you either observed or if you had any, any interest in looking into it um, the outside disturbances having an effect on the colony as a whole. Um, so was there any almost like a domino effect? Did a disturbance on some of the birds or maybe on the outer edge of where that disturbance initiated, did it, um, I guess, affect any of the other birds? Yeah, so you bring up an excellent point. Um, I didn't get into it as deep as I probably could have, but that uh, potential source of disturbance figure, I did have lines on there showing the percent of nests disturbed based on that colony. There did not seem to be much a pattern, much of a pattern between the potential sources of disturbance in and around that colony and the percent of nests that were disturbed. Um, but then to your point about this potential like trickle down or um, uh, cascade, cascading effect throughout the colony, um, there is literature out there describing that. Um, currently, I'm trying to identify these like center versus edge nests and see if there's a difference there. I don't have data on that currently. But we are interested in that and definitely looking into if there is a, an effect between the center and the edge nest to see if there could be a kind of cascading effect there. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone.
We have like one more minute. If anyone had any questions for any of the other presenters? Did you get mobbed by chance? Oh, I did, yes. You did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, no. Nice christening. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right, next we have Nick Funnel from UNC Chapel Hill, who is studying the ecological impacts of shellfish relay. So we're back under the water. Yeah. All right. It's like two four. Uh, well, thanks for coming out. And as we draw towards the end of the conference, so I appreciate you coming. Uh, yeah, I studied the impacts of shellfish relay in North Carolina, which for those of you who don't know, which was me before I undertook this project, is um, this long. It's transplanting of shellfish from polluted up estuary areas generally to uh, oyster leases downriver, where you let them clean themselves off for about four to six weeks, and then you can send them off to the general public. Um, so this is kind of an old school practice and in general, wild oysters are down 85% over the last century. So every wild oyster that's still out there is incredibly valuable to shellfish harvesters. Um, and it constitutes a moderate level of harvest in North Carolina. Wild harvest happens during the winter here. Um, and then relay starts up in the spring. Uh, and so a handful of shellfishers will get these permits that you can see sort of the, uh, that's the wrong button, but anyway, um, which is decreased in time. Um, so this is like, yeah, people apply for these permits where they can go out and provisionally go to these areas that are typically closed and they get open in the spring and they are up estuary, sort of polluted, usually with fecal coliform. And it's just a chance for them to get free oysters, which otherwise they wouldn't be able to get. Um, it is a very controversial practice for this reason, because those who are opposed, specifically in the shellfish community would say, it is not a great idea to remove oysters, which are prodigious filters, from an area that's already polluted. Um, and that's a fair argument to make. Um, but those who are pro-relay would say that actually when they work these areas, there wind up being more oysters afterwards um, by disturbing these areas. And so they say that actually winds up being a net environmental benefit. Um, and then there are also a fair amount of other arguments to be made about public trust acquisition and uh, like governmental expenses because they have to very closely watch these people um, because of the delineation zones. Like if you go too far upriver and it's a fully closed area, that's also a no-no. Um, but I'll tend to avoid the government uh, sort of speculation because I um, get in trouble for that. Uh, and then, so the other claim that they make aside from it just being environmentally beneficial is that they, uh, by working these areas and disaggregating the reefs, the, the oysters that are there, are prettier, which they describe as just being kind of wider, like more typically what you see in a restaurant, um, whereas a crowded oyster would be like pretty skinny. Um, so what they're describing here is a very well-known ecological thing, which actually relates to what Alex was just talking about, which is disturbance-based. Um, so if you are removing some of the intraspecific competition, uh, maybe that promotes more active growth of other oysters to come in and fill that space. But that has to be as long as it's in an area with a lot of oysters to begin with. So if you take an area that's very few oysters and you take them out, that'd be a problem. But um, they're claiming that these massive reefs, if you take a few out, who cares? And it helps out everybody involved for them. Um, so to talk a little bit about like the disturbance aspect of ecology, where Alex is talking about scaring a bird and seeing how long it goes until it comes back, this is more on a, a longer scale. Uh, so ecosystems are rarely in equilibrium at any given time, like we know this about any system. And the classic example of disturbance-based ecology is like the fires. Perhaps you went to um, Nick from Wake Forest's uh, lightning talk yesterday where he was talking about prescribed burns, um, where if you have a burn, like you restart this successional community thing, and then you get, you know, progressively more diverse communities, burn comes through again, that kind of thing. So what you're looking at is... Uh, like over here on the right is sort of the, cla the classic recovery trajectory of any given area. So you get a disturbance here on the left where this line comes in and then slowly over time, it maybe recovers. So we're looking at that trajectory of time as to how bad the disturbance is, how long it takes to come back. 
Um, and then this is applicable to other systems as well. Um, this is about sponges and disease, actually. That has a nice figure. So it shows when there's a response to stress, resistance means basically nothing happens. Resilience means it comes back. Uh, dysbiosis, which is more a disease term, but I'll just say that it's more like something bad happens and it doesn't really fully recover. And then acclimatization is like, ooh, it really likes disturbance and it actually makes it better over time. So those are kind of some of the ecological theories at play here. Um, so we are looking to apply that sort of disturbance-based thing to just solely look at the ecology of relay. Like you could look at the economy of it all you want, but we just wanted to hone in on that. Um, so basically to corroborate the claims that the, that the Oystermen were working on, um, we applied for a community collaborative research grant through Sea Grant, which I fully recommend people work on. They're great. And uh, to answer this question, basically to say, when you relay oysters, when you harvest them, do they come back in greater numbers? Um, and so like the factors at play there would be, does, is there more space for them to recruit? And, uh, or maybe when you disaggregate a reef, perhaps the predators are like, oh, this isn't as interesting to us anymore. It's not as dense, they go somewhere else. So maybe there's a predation release, maybe there's an interspecific release. Um, and then similarly, just sort of to uh, address the oyster bins, belief that when you work a reef, it makes like these nice pretty oysters that they're ready to go off and sell. Um, we wanted to look at like the, the health of those oysters. So like what's left there, are they better? Um, that kind of thing. So condition and shape. So to do that, we uh, just, we set up uh, in Carter County here, scenic Moorhead city. Um, these are the, a few of the relay sites around the state. Uh, that were provisionally opened for that period of time. This was spring 2021. And then there's a handful across the state, but this is one of the biggest ones and helpfully right in our backyard. Um, so we just did a before after impact sort of design where you sample before and then periodically afterwards. Um, we have five sites across these three areas. Um, and then we set up like boxes like 10 meters apart from each other and said, hey, relay here, leave this one alone. And it was very heavily, like I said, it's a community collaborative research grant. We worked with Oystermen and it wouldn't have been possible without them because they are literally doing the relay that I'm studying. So I would go out with them and say, where exactly would you like to relay? And they would show me. And uh, so that was great to work with them. And then we've been periodically sampling afterwards. I just went out like a week ago to finish, uh, hopefully finish this. You never know in grad school, it just kind of keeps going. Um, so I'm currently processing those back in the lab for numbers um, and just by excavating oysters and then shucking them till time continues. Um, this is relaying itself. So this is a father and son team, uh, Harry and Christian Bayer of uh, My Lord Honey Seafood. If you're ever down east and you're interested. Um, so I just sort of hung out with them and watched them. They did, uh, there's sort of two ways to relay. Everyone uses like these tongs. It's, it's just like old school. Like these guys are just harvesting oysters and then take them to their bottom leases. Nowadays, uh, the floating bag leases are much more popular. So people just buy seed. They don't really care as much about wild oysters, but these guys do. Um, and these guys sort on site. So you'd see like Christian here would like tong up a bunch of oysters and his dad would be like breaking them up with a crowbar and only taking the ones he wanted. And people in the, a different site would just take everything they could because they're sort of time limited. And they're like, well, I'm here. Might as well get what I can. Um, so I just sort of hang out with them and watch. And they remove like a moderate amount of oysters. Like it's really not as much as you think. Um, so, you know, nine bushels in a five by five meter box, fair amount of oysters, but not that bad. And so what did we find? We found that over time, it doesn't have that much of an impact. So we started off and just by chance and perhaps favorably to the shellfishers, our paired relay sites had more oysters to begin with. So I'd rather have them relay there than the lesser sites. They've been mad at me. Um, so there's a temporary drop here, but like there's pretty big variability. So it's hard to say over time as to whether there is a steep drop based on relay activity because there was also a pretty steep decline in the control sites. So that could have been any sort of um, environmental thing that could have happened. Disease has been a big problem over the past couple of summers in North Carolina. So that could be a factor as well. Um, so you can kind of say over time that there was a little bit of a drop, but relay doesn't make that much of a difference because these, are, these numbers are still exceedingly high. You're looking at about 650, oysters per meter square. And those in ecology sometimes say that even having 10 per meter square is a healthy reef. So like these reefs are still booming. Um, 
interestingly enough, I wouldn't stake my career on this because this is an N of three and this is an N of two. Um, but these are the folks who sorted on site and these are the folks who just removed everything. Uh, this is pretty much your classic no interaction over here with the parallel lines going. Um, and over here where they're removing everything, you definitely see like that big drop and then a little bit of a recovery, but not to regular levels yet. So there's some evidence that, you know, if you can take the time to sort on site, you should. But unfortunately, that nowadays, the harvest is so heavily regulated, they are only allowed to go out two days a week when they're going. It used to be five days a week. Um, I don't want to get too much in the government stuff. <laughs> you can find me later. Um, legal oysters, similar story, pretty much. Like, this is what the those guys care most about um, so that they can get them out to market. They still have yet to recover, but also, you know, there hasn't been that much of a difference in the others as well. Um, so if we're thinking that one of the drivers of change would have been recruitment, this is a measure of small oysters that have settled over time, no real difference. So, and that ditch aggregation did not lead to, uh, you know, extra recruitment. Um, this, I did a, a measure of how many, like what proportion of the oysters in an entire quadrat came clustered, which I just counted to be like more than one. So couplets, whatever. Um, and a pretty strong like initial disaggregation and a good recovery. So they they get back together pretty quickly to be a robust reef. And then on the claim that uh, they are wider when you work them, uh, I want to anecdotally point out that these two oysters were from the exact same plot. And here's like the, the one they don't like, and here's the ones they do like. So it doesn't seem to be much of a difference. Um, and the graph kind of backs that up too. Like maybe they converge a little bit, but error bars would say no difference. And honestly, it seems like the biggest, what we've seen from other studies as well, like the biggest driver of that shape is uh, intertidal versus subtitle. And we're upriver at this point anyway, so they're all subtitle. So it doesn't much matter. Um, yeah. And then this is a, met a metric of oyster health uh, condition index. So you basically, you shuck the, you like measure the whole oyster, shuck it, take the dirt tissue out, cook it down. And then it's like the dry mass over the wet mass. So basically like how much resources the oyster is putting into tissue. Um, and that's like a metric for health. Otherwise it'd be like shell or it'd be watery and not that good for the consumers. Uh, no real difference. Um, then the other metric that could have been responsible for uh, like disturbance-based stuff would be predation. The main predator of oysters, um, well, humans, but sponge. Um, and boring sponge is only really doing well in salinities of like above 30 pretty much. So you'd see them to be a huge problem when people are trying to restore oyster reefs in uh, subtitle salty areas. Upriver, we're looking at like salinities in the 20s. So it's not really that many, big of a problem for them. Um, so we didn't really see any difference of like abundance of sponge or like how far up the shell the sponge uh, signs would go. But we also found very little sponge to begin with. Like, so that seemed to be like, it didn't really trigger any kind of that tech, like classic disturbance. Um, so to conclude, as you've been kind of seeing along, a lot of, a lot of no results, which is as fun. Um, so it does relaying. Uh, these oysters increase the abundance over time? No, but also it doesn't really substantially decrease. So it doesn't really seem to be much of a problem. It doesn't really boost like uh, some of the oystermen might have thought, but also not a big deal. Um, so the drivers we would have expected, no real recruitment boost, no real predation release. And then on, in terms of uh, like how good the oyster is, not much of a change either. Doesn't make them worse, doesn't make them better. It just kind of is. Um, so to take away from this, this is, uh, where, where I've been working up river. So here's our little boxes. Um, and this is a big intertidal reef, but now imagine everything out here is subtitle. So it's, it's very dense, like that density, but, um, subtitle oysters. Um, so as we saw here, like the actual relaying that these people do in Carter County, um, it does temporarily disaggregate the reef and then that kind of comes back, but it doesn't really trigger any kind of big recruitment boost or reduced predation. Um, so you don't get like the benefits of disturbance, but you also don't really have much of a problem either. Um, relaying is a definitely declining practice in North Carolina. Also happy to talk more about that at some point too. Um, 
but this this generally can apply to relay in any other state along the East Coast or any form of wild harvest, um, any kind of practice. Like if it's just a moderate sort of pulling from an environment, like it's not really very detrimental, which is very good to know when we've lost so many oysters um, over the last century that by taking them out, it doesn't make that big of a deal as long as you do it sustainably in high larval areas. Um, and then beyond my relative expertise of the ecology of it is like, it's very important going forward to determine the cost and benefit to harvesters and coastal stakeholders of these areas um, amidst the context of coastal squeeze. And what I mean by that is that if oysters are doing really well up river, here's the close. So here's the three designations of harvest, right? In the winter, this blue area is, uh, you can take it as much as you want. This one is the relay area, and this is closed waters. Currently, their lease is operating like right on the edge there. And this is actually one of the guys we worked with most closely. And that line has moved from here to there over the past like decade. It's not going to move backwards. So like basically we're finding uh, that oysters, wild oysters are doing well here, but that they're, they're polluted waters because ultimately this is a land use issue. This is a water quality issue. And uh, like the local governments have been, and shellfishers have been arguing about like whether relay should continue or not. But really the problem is that like the water is too polluted for them to be able to actually access this resource. So it's not their fault. It's nobody's fault on the coast. Um, and all it would say, it'll take like comprehensive land management um, as these lines kind of creep farther up and salinities continue to rise further this way, like those subtital oyster habitats are going to decline. And I think that's very tough for local harvesters. So that kind of needs to be con considered as they're making policy changes in the future. Um, and if you want to read more kind of like a pop size summary of basically what I just gave, we just put an article out in the Coast Watch with Dave in the back. Um, so if you want to check that one out, that was just in the most recent issue. And uh, with that, just want to thank the shellfishers I worked really closely with, which was really fun. Um, the people who helped me out with this in the field and conceptually, and those of you who came to this talk. So thank you. Hey, um, thank you. I just want to question, you mentioned um, that they on average removed about eight bushels per lease. Is that, is that how much they removed when they did their relay? And that was that limited by your study or is that typically how much they take out of a closed area? That was just how many in that five by five meter box. Like throughout the whole day, they would take many more. Okay. But that's just like on okay. a very small patch scale. Yeah, okay, thanks. Hey, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm curious, so with the results you showed, is that just from a, a plot that you monitored corresponding to this father-son pair where they were harvesting? Yeah. And so I'm curious then, would you expect, are there certain wild reefs where it's known that there's more harvesting as part of this relay process? And like, is there any sort of monitoring or surveying to identify which of those reefs tends to get more of this type of harvest? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's kind of what's missing from this is like the, the prior years of uh, what happened beforehand. We kept this... Um, undisturbed through two relay seasons. So this is sort of what happens over time at just like one small patch. Um, but given the small size of these areas, yeah, they do like revisit a lot of these sites. Um, but the the reefs are so extensive and, and dense that they don't, I don't think that they are harvesting like the exact same spot, like year to year, like they're harvesting in the same area. And so I think when they were talking about like, oh yeah, we flattened this area, like we totally got rid of all the oysters one year. And then the next year there were oysters. Um, there may have been moderate response, but they also may have missed some patches, you know? 